chipped ham and football. That's what Pittsburgh does. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the PG Sports Now show here on the Post Gazette's network of podcasts. I'm Brian Batko, joined this week by Brooke Pryor from ESPN. Brooke, how's it going? Well, uh, my hamstrings, Achilles, ankles, all of those things are remarkably intact, so it could be worse. And, you know, the game this week, Steelers-Browns, which it's, it's now that I think about it, this painting behind me or whatever it is, this picture is the same one that former linebackers coach Jerry Olsavsky once asked me if those were Browns helmets. So um, I, that just comes to mind this week since they're playing Cleveland. Uh, and it's on ESPN. Does that mean we're going to see a little bit more of you on our uh, screens at, at the bars and the barbershops this week? Oh, potentially. I would say there's a chance for that, uh, especially when you added an injury to a starter, a defensive captain. Suddenly, the Steelers become a little bit more interesting, albeit for all the wrong reasons. So, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. This show is presented by Pella. There's no better place to get new windows and doors installed in your home than Pella, who can help you save on energy costs year-round. Schedule a free in-home consultation with your local Pella windows and doors to find the right product for your home and your budget. Give them a call at 866-593-1560 to discuss your project further. That's 866-593-1560. Get started planning on your new windows and doors installation with Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. Brooke, we know the Steelers got their doors blown off on Sunday by the Niners. What a uh, segue. What a throw. And we are recording this uh, Monday night at halftime of Monday Night Football between the Jets and the Bills. So, if anything else terrible happens to the Steelers in the 12 hours between us talking and maybe when people watch this, uh, that's why. It doesn't seem like anything really more can go wrong for them at this point. Chris Carter and Ray Fittipaldo obviously chopped up everything that went into that 30-7 to loss to San Francisco week one. It's a good time to have you on now because, you know, Monday afternoon the news came out that Cam Hayward – of course, longtime Steelers defensive captain, one of their three, you know, big three on defense is going to miss an extended time. It's like deja vu from last year when TJ Watt went down with a torn pec in week one. Now Cam's got that groin issue that he tried to play through a little bit, one play, and he just didn't look like himself, run, you know, trying to uh, pursue a run play from the backside and tells you the kind of competitor he is, also speaks to, you know, why it's it's such a bummer, not just because he's a good player, but I think everybody here uh, likes and respects Cam Hayward. And as Mike Tomlin would say, more sand in the bottom of the hourglass than the top for him at this point. He's got a lot of boxes he still wants to check in terms of winning a Super Bowl, winning Walter Payton Man of the Year. And this puts a real wrench into his season. What does it do for the Steelers, Brooke? Your, your panic button meter, eight and a half over under with this Cam injury. I, I get, I'm under eight and a half, assuming that we're out of 10. If we're out of like a 15, eight and a half feels, that that feels acceptable. Um, I think that I was trying to think about this, how it compares to losing TJ Watt this time a year ago. They are both hard losses, but for different reasons. With TJ, as we saw, there was no way to really replicate that sack, those sack numbers that you lose when TJ Watt goes out. They didn't have a quality third outside linebacker to rotate in with Cam Hayward. I think that the Steelers have to feel good about the depth they have on the defensive line. I mean, I feel like that was one of the more difficult positions for them to get through on cut down day. Um, they have, you know, Armand Watts is still on the roster. They've got Isaiah Loudermilk. They've got Marvin Leal. They've got Keanu Benton who's played well. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they end up elevating uh, Fioco from the practice squad, the defensive lineman, not the wide receiver, because there are two. Um, I I think that they have the bodies there that will have to rotate in because they don't have the do-it-all guy like Hayward. And you factor in that Larry Ogunjobi is, is always limited with this foot injury, and it kind of feels like you never know what you're going to get with him, that I think that there's just – a lot more instability with the defensive line, but you can, I think, do some patchwork things to get through however much time you're going to be without him. The thing that you lose when you lose Cam Hayward, though, that you can't quite quantify is that leadership part of it. I mean, I I would expect that he'll still be on the sideline. He'll still be in the meeting rooms. This is not a guy that's going to go 
rehab on his own somewhere. That's that's not how Cam Hayward works, but there's an intangible type of wisdom, leadership, fieriness, all of those things are why Cam Hayward's a captain. And to lose that week one, especially in a loss like this, where you kind of feel this team is searching for its identity in a lot of ways, it really hurts to now take that, take Kim Hayward out of that equation. That's a really good point. Like he, yes, he's still going to be around. He'll be on the sideline in street clothes, but he's a guy who holds people accountable on the field. And you, if you're, I, you know, I've, (laughs) Obviously, I don't play with Cam Hayward and never have, but I assume if you're one of those other 10, you, there's a feeling that you don't want to let a guy like that down on any given play. Plus, he's typically the one who's you know running running a, a guy down 20 yards down the field, sometimes making the tackle himself uh, as a defensive lineman. So that that is a, an intangible quality that you lose. The tangible quality that you lose is your most disruptive defensive lineman. You're right. I mean, I think Ogan Joby... You know, I saw a couple flashes here and there Sunday, but certainly didn't look like a, a guy who was worthy of a three-year, $28 million deal this offseason. And, you know, as you were naming, uh, to going through the list of players, it's it's really fitting that you didn't even mention Montrevious Adams because he is like the Gosh. forgotten man on the D-line. I'm so sorry, like, it, Montrevious. Oh. Yeah, I mean, and it's not uh, – it's more much more of an indictment of him than anything else that – he was out there a decent bit a Sunday, but uh, was getting blown off the ball with regularity. And in a weird way, I think the, the way that he plays, maybe he can help you a little more because I don't think he's a true nose tackle. He can use some – his get-off ability, maybe he can cause some more problems if he's playing in that nickel package. But, yeah, I mean, there's just really no good way to spin this. You you hit the nail on the head, Brooke. Like, you can bring up a Braden Fihoko or even a Jonathan Marshall from the practice squad and – I think everybody felt good about those guys as the sixth or seventh defensive linemen, but you know, obviously none of them are Cam. And bigger question is, or, or biggest, you know, concern probably is that Larry Ogan, Joby, DeMarvin Leal, Keanu Benton, at least not yet, those guys aren't Cam Hayward either. Exactly. And I and I even think back to when Stefan Tuitt was on the team, right? And he had injuries. It was like, okay, well, Tuitt's banged up, but you've got Cam. Like Cam has always been the steady presence of the defensive line and of the defense as a whole, even as he's gotten older, he does not like to talk about his age. He's almost in the last couple of years felt like he's been aging like Benjamin button and played his best football late. And so it it felt like in that way, like, gosh, this is a guy that you can't imagine losing because even when he's banged up, he's found a way to play and to lose that guy. Like you said, the, the one who, makes you feel like I can't let this guy down because he's, you know, going to hold you accountable. He's coming to the end of his career, whether he wants to admit it or not. And he's a guy that I think so many people on this team play for, and you, you just can't replace it. Like, yes, they have depth, but they don't have necessarily starter capable depth. And so I think that this just introduces a lot more of a rotation and a lot more of a chess match that this becomes a big challenge for Terrell Austin to you know, figure out every single play, how you're going to match up, knowing that you're going to have to probably rotate between a Montrevious Adams type, um, Keanu Benton, then DeMarvin Leal, who's smaller and not as great at run defense, which didn't really feel like anybody was last week. And they're facing, I mean, they've got what Nick Chubb this week and Josh Jacobs next week. It doesn't like, they're not Christian McCaffrey level players. They're, they're different but they're still really good running backs. Two of the other best, like if you're going to ask me to name the best three running backs in the NFL, it's kind of right there. So you, you could make a case that it's those three for sure. Yes, it is. It, this is a really, I mean, you never want to lose a guy like Kim Hayward, but this is a really bad time to have this happen. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking that when, when you were talking about it at the beginning, comparing it to, to TJ Watts injury last year, I, obviously Watt would be the toughest guy to lose on defense. But after that, it's probably Cam, maybe Minka Fitzpatrick because of the way he played last season, everything he brings at the back end. But these are exactly the kind of <laughs> debates that you don't want to have, especially this early in the season. And I think you could actually make an argument that on the offensive side of the ball, especially with the the way the passing game looked after he went out, Deontay Johnson might be the player you can least af- afford to lose in, in some respects. And I know he's a 
much maligned player at times, but I thought he looked good yesterday, or excuse me, I should say Sunday, until that hamstring issue. And I mean, those are tricky too. I mean, we, we know groins are bad and that's what Cam's dealing with, but those hamstring um, injuries, that those can be day to day, but they can also be week to week and, and really cause issues, especially for somebody who plays the receiver position. Exactly. The, the soft tissue injuries are the worst because you just can't predict the timeline, especially like you said, for a receiver, someone that, I mean, every position in football depends on a hamstring, no duh. But when you have a guy that is as fast twitch as Deontay Johnson, he needs to have full mobility. I also think that it is a shame that this has happened when it felt like he was trying to get past last season. He obviously didn't score any touchdowns last year. I think that, you know, you can say he can, he can tell us a million times that's in the past, it's over with. But you've got to think that that is still in the back of his mind when he's out there. And the relief and the pressure that's going to be lifted when he finally scores that, I think is going to be substantial. And now it feels like that's going to be delayed even more. Um, I think that the way that Pickens has developed, the way that, that Calvin Austin has developed out there, you add Allen Robinson, having Deontay Johnson is kind of, he's not the fourth receiver, he's just the fourth in this list. But to have that complement of receivers felt like it had the potential to open up the pass game, to give Kenny Pickett more of these options. And it felt like, too, okay, well, you can't double Deontay Johnson because you've got George Pickens. If you double George Pickens, then Deontay's open. Like, it felt like, okay, this is this is how this receiver core should work. They have potential to not be one-dimensional. And then you have an injury like that. And it's similar to the defensive line where you feel like, okay, like, yeah, Gunnar Olszewski, he's, he's a good receiver. He's, you've got good depth in the wide receiver group. But, like, you've got good depth as the sixth or seventh guy, not as to move in to be one of the top four guys. You've got some good, like, rotational pieces, but you you don't want to see Gunner out there for, you know, 80% of the offensive snaps. So I think that, that, yeah, this is – this really – this, I think, is going to be a setback for this offense. And as we saw on Sunday, they can't really afford to have many of those. We'll know more definitively about him uh, you know, maybe as soon as today when Mike Tomlin talks at noon. We'll also find out more about Chooks Okorafor, the right tackle, who Tomlin said is probably in concussion protocol. So we'll, uh, we will hear more about that. Uh, first, we'll tell you about Goldberg, Persky, and White. If you were diagnosed with mesothelioma or lung cancer, call your local attorneys at Goldberg, Persky, and White for over 40 years. Their firm has represented thousands of lung cancer and mesothelioma victims. Call 1-800-COMPLEX or visit gpwlaw.com for a free consultation. Also, a quick word from Propel. Propel's 13 public charter schools in Allegheny County build a solid academic foundation for lifelong learning and offer more personalized instruction at every level during your child's uh, uh, kindergarten through 12th grade education journey. So give your children the quality education they deserve. Learn more and apply to Propel Schools by visiting propelschools.org. Brooke, with with Deontay Johnson going down, it put even more of a microscope on George Pickens. And at times, you know, he looked frustrated on the sideline. You know, one thing that I noticed a couple times from the press box was he was sitting by himself on the bench, uh, sort of away from the rest of the receivers. And then the quarterbacks, you know, they kind of sit by themselves too with uh, their coach, Mike Sullivan. But then also he was – at one point having kind of an animated conversation, or at least it looked to be, with his position coach, Frisman Jackson. Then Monday morning, I, you know, one of those Instagram sleuths out there. I don't, I don't understand how people find this stuff, but it is truly incredible. People have a lot of time on their hands. People uh, stalk the Instagram pages of athletes such as George Pickens. Um, but I guess he put up a video of himself before the game on Sunday, and one of the comments on it was, Somebody's got to get this guy the ball, though, and Pickens liked it. So I would c- classify this as a minor social media dust up, especially compared to uh, what this team was like before you and I got on the beat in 2019. But uh, Pickens kind of shrugged it off today and gave a bit of a, uh, a inscrutable explanation of what happened there. Just what do you uh, what do you make of the Pickens? And I guess I should mention too, because I tweeted this, and it's gotten a ton of uh, people some 
being mad at me and some uh, just highlighting it. But I went up to George after the game and just I waited till he got dressed and said, hey, George, you got time for a few quick ones thinking <laughs> you think you're the best receiver on the planet. You didn't do much today and the offense overall stunk. So let's hear his perspective. And he wasn't like a jerk about it. He's just like, nah, bro, I really don't have anything to say after a game like that. So like, okay, I got you. We'll keep it moving then. Um, but what do you, what do you make of this whole situation? Uh, much ado about nothing or is, is number 14 uh, not real happy with the way things are going? I think that George Pickens is someone that fans will love when the team is doing well and will be quick to scrutinize when they're not. Um, and case in point, right? I mean, he has the preseason that he has, the training camp highlights that he has. He's easy to like when you see the one-handed grabs and everything else. But as much as you like the emotion seen from him after he makes a catch in a training camp um, or, you know, a celebration and whatever, when it you can't – I'm trying to think of how to put this – the way that he celebrates the good things in Latrobe, it's a double-edged sword, right? Like the, the He's a fiery that, player. He's a fiery right, guy. Right. <laughs> exactly. So you're going to have the highs of him doing a great thing. And with the lows, those emotions are going to come out and they're going to be directed in a way that's not beneficial to the team. I mean, he had, what, an unnecessary roughness penalty at the end of the yeah. game that could have yeah, been avoided. We that. saw that, right? Like we saw that several times last year at times when he got frustrated I had a similar experience with him in Atlanta after uh, the Steelers won, but he came off the, the field screaming to get the ball thrown to him. Right. And I tried to talk to him afterward in the locker room and he declined the interview. And it, it's one of those things where it's a player absolutely has a right to decline an interview as a reporter. You're reporting, Hey, this is, this is what happened. And when you have a guy going into his second year and you've brought in Allen Robinson to not only be the slot receiver, but also to mentor George Pickens as he, you know, develops into what they hope will be a number one receiver and one of the best wide receiver quarterback duos in the league. You want to see some maturity from a receiver and the things that we saw Sunday suggest that there's still some growth that has to happen there, especially gosh, you really hate to have to dive into the Instagram comments and the social media stuff in week one. It is too early for this. But it was interesting to me the explanation that he gave for the Instagram stuff, right? We asked him about it. um, And the response was, well, I have my comments turned off and you can't even tag me in anything. Well, that's I not quite some what that. happened. I checked some of that. Like, you can't tag him, at least not as of, like, six months ago or something. But right. the comments are clearly on, at least to some subset of followers. So right. I the didn't really know on, what to make of that. <laughs> and it was liked. I mean, we talked to him right before one thirty, And after he said that that didn't happen... A couple of us checked the Instagram feed. It was still like I screenshotted it. Just it's so gone now, know, right? It, it, yeah, and it's gone now. The comment is gone, and the like is gone, and that disappeared between one thirty and two, which would have been after we talked to him about it. And so, to me, I think that I, I would have liked to see there be some ownership of it in that moment. You know, whether it's you or it could have been a social media manager, it could have been somebody else who posted the video to the feed, who then liked it, right? It could have been any number of things, but that's still a situation where you can say, I didn't mean to like it. I was scrolling. I hit a button. Somebody else was on, whatever. There's anything other than like avoiding it in that way. And I just- Like telling people that two plus two equals five. (laughs) Yes, exactly. I think that, I think that George Pickens has all the talent in the world. I think the thing- that could be his undoing if he doesn't get it in control are those emotions are the frustration that he gets that he doesn't seem to know how to channel it. And that, I mean, no matter how long Deontay Johnson's out or how, you know, effective he is going forward, like you need George Pickens to be able to play with a clear mind and be an effective part of this offense. 
Yeah. I just thought it was a, a huge storyline going into this season that his usage was pretty inconsistent as a rookie, including that season opener at Cincy, which very similar situation, tons of hype and buzz and incredible plays he made all throughout the summer and camp and preseason. And then boom, they barely throw to him in the first game. And, um, you know, I, I think he was clearly not real happy after that game either, but at least they won. And again, you mentioned the Atlanta thing. And, and even then this off season, there was just a lot of talk from him that he was very confident that that was going to change, that he was going to be, you know, much more featured in this. And it's, you know, from our perspective, it's kind of like, well, that's true, but there is only one ball to go around and there are a lot of other talented pass catchers. So I thought that was a subplot coming into 2023 and yeah, once again, I mean, I've always looked at it as if you're an athlete or a coach, you're in a space that's designated as a place for us to come ask you questions that readers might want to hear the answers to. Um, you know, it's it's kind of up to us what we ask, and it's very much up to you if and how you want to answer the questions. So, um, you know, he obviously talked on uh, on Monday uh, when the, the team, the players were in the locker room. And yeah, a lot, a lot of uh, we just got to keep working. So. Uh, we also will, I guess, keep an eye, keep an eye on that. Um, so we'll we'll see what happens with Pickens uh, and the rest of this passing offense week two uh, against the Browns, who uh, held Joe Burrow under 100 yards passing. So <laughs> something's something's got to give there for for both of these squads. Uh, Brooke, anything else you want to add before I let you go? And also feel free to tell uh, tell our viewers what they can expect from you and the network this week as we go into, I believe it's the Steelers' only Monday night game, right? It is. It is their only Monday night game, but they have Sunday night after and throughout the season two Thursday night games, so you won't miss the Steelers in primetime. This week on ESPN.com, there will be a story on the death of the deep ball that I have been working on for a while. It applies to the Steelers, but maybe not quite in the same way as some other teams because the Steelers do take an actual, their percentage of shots that they take down the field, they take more deep ball shots than other teams. They're not as successful. Um, But the overall trend is that the deep balls have, um, there have been fewer in the last couple of years. And that trend has held true so far, at least through Sunday night's games. Um, Looks like that will probably end up being the case in this Monday night football game. And, you know, we'll have wall to wall coverage from, uh from this whole week from Cleveland from Pittsburgh uh you know if we have any time to talk about the Monday night game in between Aaron Rodgers Achilles <laughs> ankle updates yes and uh and we will see you Monday night at Acrisure Stadium I will see you throughout the week at practice obviously but uh yeah that's that's the next time that uh the Steelers will get a chance to get this taste out of their mouths for Brooke Pryor uh thanks for joining me Brooke I'm Brian Batko thanks to all of you for checking us out again here on the PG Sports Now show on the Post Gazette's uh, podcast network. Chris Carter will be back with you Wednesday for some more Steelers talk and stay tuned to postgazette.com all week for more coverage. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you enjoyed the video, please like it, subscribe to our YouTube podcast. channel. Check out our Apple Podcast channel for more podcast content. Click below for a special deal of 99 cents for a three-month subscription to the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. 